Okay, so good morning, everyone. So it's a privilege to introduce our ne next speaker, Dr. Kevin Comber, whose contribution is part the intersection of internet photonics technology and workforce work development. Dr. McComber is the co founder and CEO of Spark Photonics Design, where he leads innovation in integrated photonics, an area that underpins advancements in high bandwidth telecommunications and holds promise for putting edge applications in quantum information science, chemical and biological studies. So, his academic background includes both a BC and a PhD in material science and engineering from MIT. And he brings a wealth of experience for drawing uh, an Intel and MIT in semiconductor processes and education. So today's talk will explore not only the fundamental aspects of uh, integrated photonics, but also recent breakthroughs from uh, spark photonics science. So additionally, uh, additionally, Dr. Maxomber will address a pressing challenge in our field, the time gap in photonics and semiconductor industries and share how the Spark Photonics Foundation is for fostering early stage and in STEM to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. So please join me and welcome Dr. Kevin McComber. Great. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Um, buenos dias todos. Gracias por invitarme. Uh, as uh, Dr. Martinez said, my name is Kevin McCumber. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spark Photonics and the executive director of Spark Photonics Foundation. Just a quick point of personal interest, my great-grandfather on my mother's side, so my mom's mom's dad, uh, was born and raised in Jalisco, Mexico. Uh, so I am one-eighth Mexican and very proud to be part of this conference with you. All right. Um, so as uh, Dr. Martinez says, I'm going to jump a little bit into integrated photonics and in looking at uh, some of the uh, thrust of this conference, it looks like a lot of it's in electronics. So I want to make sure that we come at this in a way that everybody kind of is on the same page, that it's approachable. If you're not familiar with photonics or integrated photonics at all, I want to make this uh, still possible for you to understand. Um, so the first point here in our outline will be a discussion of integrated photonics and the growing ecosystem around integrated photonics, starting just with what in the world integrated photonics are. And then I want to make it real for you and talk a bit about an application that's very close to um, uh, to us here at Spark because we do a lot of work in it, and that's in virus sensing using integrated photonics. And then I'll conclude with um, discussion of our K through 14 educational outreach through the foundation. Uh, K through 14, if you're not familiar with the term, means kindergarten, so about age five, through grade 14 or the second year of college. Great. So just jump right into it here. Let's talk about integrated photonics and what this ecosystem is and how it's growing. <clears throat> I want to start, like I said, by introducing everybody to photonics and integrated photonics, assuming you might not have a background in this. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit pedantic here and step you through um, this glossary so that then we have a good foundation on which to build for the rest of the discussion. So photonics is the generation, manipulation, and detection of light. And integrated photonics is the shrinking down, the miniaturization of photonic devices onto the surface of a semiconductor chip. We use the term PIC, meaning photonic integrated circuit, to kind of be interchangeable with integrated photonics. So we often refer to it just as PICs, uh, photonic integrated circuits or photonic integrated chips. <clears throat> and then finally, a foundry is a facility that fabricates PIC designs submitted by external users. This is you know, the, the way that most semiconductors are manufactured today by the likes of folks like TSMC, Tower, and even Intel has a foundry service. So you know, to give you a very kind of stark view of why integrated photonics can be completely disruptive. If you look at the image here on the left, that's a typical free space photonics bench setup, maybe at a university or even in industry, right? It's a, it's a, a light source going through a series of photonic or optical devices uh, and making kind of a, a bench top circuit. And what we do with integrated photonics is we can actually shrink that down through the power of semiconductor manufacturing and photolithography to make that equivalent circuit 
on the surface of a semiconductor chip like is on this person's finger on the right side. And what's also something to note here is that it wouldn't just be, say, one of these circuits on this chip. It could be hundreds or even thousands. So there's a large, uh, you know, orders of magnitude difference in the scale. And of course, that uh, has huge benefits in size, weight, and power, as well as cost, if these can be mass produced, and, and robustness, right? It's very hard to, to break that chip, to shake anything loose, for example. But the system on the left it's very easy to misalign with simple vibrations. And that's important when you want to put photonics into any kind of real world system like a aircraft, spacecraft, um, anything that moves basically. Integrated photonics is no longer a niche ecosystem. Uh, it is large and it is still continuing to grow. We're seeing an emergence of pick foundries and off-the-shelf pre-designed components that allow folks to get in with a low barrier to entry. And this is also enabling low-cost photonic sensors, automotive LiDAR, high-performance computing, and even other applications, some of which are not even known yet. Of course, the big application for integrated photonics has been in telecommunications and data communications, and there are huge names in that space, right? TSMC here, we're showing the the um, announcement, TSMC, Broadcom, NVIDIA, right? Intel, Tower Semiconductor, these folks all work in integrated photonics. Those are big names, but there are also small names in this field. And if you look at the lower right, this is a, a smattering of uh, foundries and testing and packaging firms offering PIC design kits via our software partner, Lucida Photonics. So some very small players up to very large players. It's a very dynamic ecosystem. So I want to give you an idea then of what it actually takes to make a pick, right? Um, and I like to think about this in three steps. First being design, second fabricate, and third and test and package. In the design space, we as designers use specialized software that then ultimately creates what's basically a blueprint for the chip. Um, and that's what we do here at Spark Photonics. So I put our logo there to remind you that that is where Spark Photonics plays. And that's where I'm coming from in this talk. But as you can see, the design flows into the other aspects. And of course, in uh, actuality, this is really more of a circular loop. There will be many passes through these three uh, phases over the course of developing the development of a pick. So the second step then is to fabricate the pick that's done at a foundry, a fab, uh, and you as the, as the customer get back one to many chips. And then finally, the chips are tested and packaged to understand their performance, make sure that they work, um, connect them to the outside world with optical and electrical connections, and then typically to encapsulate it to protect it from the environment. I wanted to dig down a little bit into the design phase here. Um, again, I think of this in three steps, across component, circuit, and layout. In the component, component step, we would de design the actual individual devices that are going to go on the chip. Um, in this case, we're showing an image of a one by two splitter. So it splits a beam of light on the left into two beams of light coming out the right. Then once we have that component design, and of course there could be many components that are designed for a specific wavelength or a range of wavelengths, we then connect them up into a circuit. Um, in this image here, we're showing an optical circuit of many of these one by two splitters hooked into what's called a splitter tree. So it's going from one to two to four to eight to 16. And then finally, once we're ready to send this to the foundry for fabrication, we reduce it to the final blueprint, the layout. Or if you're familiar with electronics, you're probably familiar with GDS files. We use the same file format in photonics. We produce the GDS and that goes to the foundry. So this, this general flow is, I think, um, similar to what's used in electronics, but what's probably a bit different is here on the left side where we're using first principles physics simulations to simulate devices um, because a lot of devices are still not um, designed for the functionality or the wavelengths or the wavelength ranges that people are trying today. So it's still a little bit of the Wild West in the component level, and that's where there's um, still a lot of development happening, especially in academia and government. We can move to the next slide here. There we go. <clears throat> okay, this is a little bit of an overwhelming slide, so I'm going to take a little time to walk you through it. The, the goal here is to show you that integrated photonics 
is not all silicon. So what we have here on the right side, on the top, is a list of different um, elements or, or compounds, um, materials that are used for integrated photonics. And then the, the x-axis is the wavelength range. It's actually down here, 2 to 20 microns wavelength. And then the white part here is the transparency window um, for each of these materials. So you can see that silicon has a transparency window from, um, it goes down to about 1.1 micron. But on the bottom here, if you look at the applications, right, telecom, microwave photonics, spectroscopy, quantum sensing, et cetera, the green shows the wavelength range that are needed to address those applications. And integrated photonics are trying to work across all these applications and more. So the point of this is to show that, for example, silicon has this cut up cut off at 1.1 micron. But for example, for quantum or sensing, which is where we at Spark do a lot of our work, at these lower wavelengths, silicon doesn't work. It's it's uh, it's not transparent. Uh, you can't send light through it. So we need to work in other material systems. At Spark, we do a lot of work in silicon nitride, as well as in lithium niobate because of these wider transparency windows. So again, the takeaway from this is not everything in integrated photonics is done on silicon. Although, of course, silicon is by and large the, the dominant material platform, right? So here's a slide that digs into that a little bit more. Um, we can integrate different materials on a silicon platform and it's showing it by the function. So passives, meaning no electrical activity, nonlinear uh, materials, isolators, actives, and gain materials. These all require different materials and they can all be put onto a silicon substrate through what is called heterogeneous integration. And this is a pretty large area of exploration right now in integrated photonics, especially um, around the gain media to be able to get sources and, and the, well, especially sources, but also um, SOAs, uh, so optical amplifiers um, and modulators onto a silicon chip. Um, by integrating 3.5s on there, we can get that, but that integration process is still pretty challenging. So speaking of challenges, I wanted to just outline for you some challenges that were top of mind for me uh, recently in no particular order. Optical input and output in integrated photonics is still a challenge, right? We're going from a fiber to a chip. This image down here on the left is a good example. If you need to go on and off chip, you need to have a fiber going in, something happens on the chip, and then a fiber coming out. And that coupling between the fiber and the chip can be challenging in large part due to the mode mismatch, the, the size of the light essentially, between the fiber, which is large, and the chip waveguide, the light wire, that's very small. It's also a big challenge, as I mentioned, to get an on-chip light source. On-chip isolators are still a challenge as well uh, with the integration of some materials in the foundry flows. Thermal effects in integrated photonics can be very significant. Integrated photonic devices are subject to the thermal optic effect. So changing the temperature, for example, putting it into you know, a, a, a hot, rugged atmosphere um, can make the devices change their performance. Um, so we need to take special precautions either design for that or put in other components that can compensate for it. And then packaging and testing approaches are still a little bit of the wild west here as well. Um, there's, we're working towards standardization, but there's still room to improve on uh, how we do that packaging and testing, especially starting at the design phase, which is an area that Spark is, uh, is pretty active in. <clears throat> and then the cost of packaging and testing can also be a large portion of the cost of the, the total device. Okay, so that's a very long lead in to introduce our company and why it is I'm talking with you today um, based on our work. Spark, for, Spark Photonics uh, works in uh, three different categories of offerings. Our technical services where we do design and layout and we also develop things called process design kits to help designers do design and layout. We offer consulting. We also have some software and hardware, software made by others, Lucida Photonics, which is based in Belgium. We distribute it in North America. And we also sell our own software for um, a functionality called design rule checking. And we send, we sell ch actual chips and measurement data along with them, <clears throat> fabricated at a foundry in New York State in the United States uh, to help especially graduate students get up to speed on how to do pick measurements. We also then have a third area of business, which is actually through a separate company, the Spark Photonics Foundation, which is a nonprofit educational outreach organization that we'll talk about in the third portion of this talk, where we run educational outreach programming to get young folks interested in photonics and semiconductors. 
This is an overall view of the organization. As I mentioned, we're actually two companies. So on the commercial side, Spark Photonics Design, we're primarily a team of engineers. And on our educational workforce side, Spark Photonics Foundation, we're a team of educators and uh, advisors. Al, my co-founder and I started both companies the same day, early 2019. Um, and we continue to work with both of them. Al is an advisor and I'm day-to-day -day management at both organizations. Okay, I'm gonna jump in now to dig into one specific application that um, is using integrated photonics. It's a project we're working on, which is human virus sensing. This is in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It was funded and continues to be funded by the United States government. So this project is led by the University of Rochester, and uh, the goal is to create an inexpensive, portable, rapid response photonic chip-based system to detect human viruses. Like I said, motivated by coronavirus, but as we're gonna talk about in a bit, it could actually detect any human virus. All you need to activate it is a drop of blood, saliva, or serum that is then collected on a card that includes an integrated photonic chip, and that card is then inserted into a reader for analysis. So on the right here in this picture, this is an image of a prototype of this card with the photonic chip, and I'm gonna uh, lead you through what you're seeing on here. So this kind of teardrop shaped portion is the sample well. This is where the user would put their drop of blood saliva or serum. It then wicks through capillary action through this channel. So there's no motor or any kind of power needed for it. Um, and it goes under this little black rectangle, which is actually the pick. This is the integrated photonic chip. On um, the bottom surface that's been flipped over, are some devices called ring resonators that are used to sense viruses. So that sample flows over those ring resonators, those photonic devices, and then eventually it flows into this reservoir and just collects there. Um, this card is then inserted into a reader and light is shot into this chip. It goes through the chip, through those ring resonator devices, comes out the other end and goes back into the reader. The reader, by the way, would be like a desktop kind of a unit. Um, so the light is passed through this pick and comes back out, and then the reader analyzes the data it gets out of that light and is able to tell you whether you have uh, the viruses that this, uh, this chip is functionalized for or not. So I want to show you what that actually looks like. Um, the image on the left is just, just to give you an idea of scale. There's a person holding another version, another prototype of that card. And you see here the little black part, that is, that is the pick. So it's one millimeter by four millimeters, um, kind of the size of a large piece of rice, a, a piece of jasmine rice maybe. Very, very small, right? So you could get hundreds of thousands of these off a single wafer. And then on the right here um, is some of the data collected from a chip like this. And, and there are a number of things to note here. So on the x-axis of these graphs are the time in minutes, and on the y is the shift in the resonance of these ring resonators. And I won't get into what exactly that means, but essentially think of it as a shift means how much coronavirus or how much virus of any kind there is in a sample that went, went over it. This was tried with two different patients in this example, a patient who was negative for COVID-19, and you can see there was no shift, there's no indication of the virus, and a patient who was positive. And of course you can see that there's a, a very substantial shift. So some things to note here, right? The x-axis time in minutes, after one minute or even less, we can tell this person is positive for COVID-19. You think about the test we do today, right? It says you have to wait 15 minutes. So we can know almost immediately. And that can that can be very critical in, in a lot of situations. Um, another thing to note here is the slope of this line is actually how much virus there is in the sample. So if we were to take this test today and then take it tomorrow and then take it the next day, you could look at the slope of this and if it's going down, that means you're coming out of having, you know, right, the virus is receding. You don't have as much anymore. If it's going up, that means you're actually you know, having the virus grow in you. So now it's no longer, do I have it or do I not? It's how much do I have it and how am I trending? Um, I'm sure a lot of us got stuck, you know, with positive COVID tests for a number of days or even weeks, waiting for it to go away when we felt fine. And now we'd be able to say, okay, you are still, you do still have some virus, but it's been down and it's coming down. Um, so we might be able to have a little bit more fine detail around when we could, you know, release folks from quarantine, for example. 
Um, a final thing to note here, I've been talking about coronavirus or COVID-19, but this chip is actually um, made in a way such that it can detect any virus. You put a sp special chemical on certain parts of the surface of this chip, and that chemical responds to a different virus. It's completely tailored to whatever human virus we want. So we can actually detect up to eight viruses at a time on the surface of one of these tiny grain of rice chips. So that could be COVID, you know, Delta vir variant, Omicron variant, HIV, HPV, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, kind of any flavor you want. So um, it, it's called multiplexing, and that really enhances the power of this type of detection because now you're not just looking for one virus, but we're able to look for multiple viruses at a time, uh, which can also be very helpful if we're spreading these tests across a lot of different populations. Our role at Spark on this project is to analyze the manufacturing variability. You could imagine that if you're going to be making this as a low-cost sensor, right, we're looking to have these be way less than a dollar each, we're going to be making these in the, the hundreds of millions. Um, and you want to make sure that every sensor is going to work. Um, so our role at Spark was to put these kind of funky looking structures you see on the right side. This is um, some mock center interferometers, which are uh, interferometric devices, onto the, the wafer and it's repeated across the wafer and, and a number of different chips, 64 chips per wafer. And then we use these structures to analyze different properties of the material on the chip. And we can then use that to infer whether the resulting sensors would likely be in spec or not. In other words, would they would they work how we expected them to? And we could then say, OK, we know that across a wafer, for example, the, sim the, the devices we get out of this portion of the wafer are likely not to work based on the data we're getting. We can also monitor the manufacturing process over time, make sure that what we're putting out is going to be good. So to show you what that looks like in practice, um, I'm going to try to walk you through this graph. And I've got a build of this slide. There will be a second graph I'll show in a minute to show some improvements. This is data we collected in 2021 off of 64 chips from one wafer that was fabricated at AIM Photonics. On the y-axis, I've actually blanked out the, the numerical values just for data protection, but this is the loss of the optical circuit. In other words, you can think of it as how much light you know, got trapped inside the chip and didn't make it back out. On the x-axis is lambda, which is the wavelength. So we're doing a wavelength sweep and seeing how much light is lost in the chip. And based on these devices, you would expect to see it's kind of a beat pattern. It's basically a series of hills and valleys. It goes up and down, up and down. Um, and that's due to the, in, you know, the interference of these devices. Constructive interference, where all the light comes back out, or destructive, where it gets trapped, essentially, and, and dissipated on the chip. The point here is that if you look at this, this is 64 different spectral plots all laid over each other. It's a mess. It's a huge mess. You can't discern any kind of pattern from this. But then over a year of intense process engineering with a lot of feedback data in that loop, remember the design and fabricate test loop, a lot of feedback data from that loop, AIM Photonics did process engineering to get it to a point where now with 64 chips across the wafer, you can definitely discern the pattern. It's very clear. There's very little variation. That, that variation that made this left side the mess is all due to manufacturing. And with Ames process engineering, they were able to bring that in very low variability. Um, so you can get very, very uniform devices out of this process so that every sensor you get across this wafer is going to perform nearly, identif nearly identically or at least identically enough that it's not going to matter in the readout from the device. OK. Dr. Martinez, I'm not sure if um, we wanted to do questions in the middle. I feel like I've been talking a lot, and I would love to see if anyone wants to ask anything. I don't mean to just barrel through. <laughs> okay. So, somebody have a question? Hmm. Sorry, I was getting some feedback there. I wasn't able to hear. Sorry, I still wasn't able to, to understand it.
Oh, it looks like uh, Arturo has a question. Maybe we could go to him. <clears throat> okay, hello, how are you? Very well, uh, thank you. It, uh, it is an interesting talk. Uh, the first time I, I am exposed to the PIC technology. And so I would like to know a little more about the software that you use for designing and also where you fabricate the uh, this kind of uh, devices, uh, the foundry or something, or where in what laboratory you, you do these integrated uh, photonic uh, circuits. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm going to scroll back up here to where I gave the overview of oops, getting a little bit of feedback there. OK, um, I'm going to go to this slide. So you asked about the software that we use for design. Um, there's actually different software packages that are used for the design of different parts uh, in, in this, uh, this flow. At the component level, we use something called finding difference time domain or eigenmode expansion software. This is made by the likes of ANSYS. That's actually the software that we use. Um, we use their, their software to do this component level. And then at the circuit level and the layout level, we use software made by our software partner, Lucida Photonics, to be able to hook these devices together, simulate what they um, what the performance will be as a circuit, and then reduce that circuit to layout. Lucida software does both of those, um, and that's accepted by um, by over 30 different foundries worldwide. So kind of leading into your, your second question about foundries we go to, um, all of our fabrication is done at uh, commercially available foundries. There are lots of them. Um, going back to, to this image here in the bottom right, a lot of these are, are foundries, either in silicon photonics or in 3.5s or in thin film lithium niobate, for example. Some of them are packaging or testing houses. Um, we fabricate uh, a lot uh, with AIM Photonics, where we kind of got our start. We also do a lot of work with the Tower Semiconductor here in the United States, uh, because a lot of our customers are based in the United States or need to use domestic resources. Um, but lots of foundries in Europe, as well as Asia, and we've uh, fabricated um, there as well. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for thank the question. You. I appreciate it. Happy to take another one or continue on. Seeing and hearing none, I'll continue, but please feel free to jump in if uh, there's something you'd like to ask before I move on. Um, so now I'm gonna shift gears quite substantially and talk about K through 14 educational outreach. Just as a reminder, K14 refers to students in kindergarten, so about age five, through the 14th grade or second year of college, approximately um, 20 years old if you kind of go on all the way straight through from high school or possibly even adult learners. And I want to talk about um, some work that we've been doing in this space, specifically in our, our program that's called Spark Alpha. This is uh, project-based learning in semiconductors and photonics. It introduces students to photonics, semiconductors, advanced manufacturing, and entrepreneurship uh, using a collaborative project where they conceptualize innovative integrated photonics products to address real-world challenges. So what does this mean in practice? This means students in a classroom, this is in an existing class in their school, um, our program is run in that classroom and the students in teams of three to five go through four phases of this project-based learning experience. In phase one, they identify a problem that is important to them and then they quantify the impact of that problem on some community. It might be their family, it might be um, their school, maybe their community, the, their city, the country, or the world. But they have to come up with why that problem is important. And then in phase two, they go into product development where they conceptualize, that means they just come up with the idea of a photonics sensing-based hardware product to identify the problem identified in phase one. So for example, we have a lot of students that are concerned about climate change, um, and they want to develop a sensing product to be able to sense harmful gases in the atmosphere or sense um, methane coming out of exhaust and be able to tell, right, if uh, 
there's, for example, an unallowable amount of methane or to track methane production out of a factory. So they developed this product concept. Again, they're not actually making it. They're coming up with an idea for it. They're welcome to design it and even try to make a mock model of it. Um, but they're just coming up with the idea. In the third phase, they create a business model to launch and sell this product at a profit. So now we're getting into an entrepreneurial aspect of it, right? How do you take something that's an idea and actually bring it to reality, make it real so that it sees the light of day and has life? And then the fourth and final phase, they do a final pitch in front of a live audience, um, often including a panel of judges from their school, the district, uh, local industry, and local academia, where they're pitching their product idea and their business model concept. And then the panel's asking them questions about it, um, often some pretty challenging questions. So students really have to hone those presentation skills uh, and be quick on their feet to respond to questions. It's very much how things are in the real world, right? Um, I can attest to that, <laughs> giving this presentation right now. So we think that this is a very uh, powerful way to not only introduce them to the technology, but to build those real world life skills that are so necessary as they get into their later education and their college and, and uh, industry careers. Two important parts of the program are also to get them thinking outside the walls of their classroom. We have in education and industry exploration built into the program. In education exploration, they take a virtual or in-person field trip to an education partner. This could be a technical high school, it could be a two-year college, it could be a four-year college or university. It's to see what education pathways exist in the field and to talk to current students, talk to faculty, talk to admissions, talk to financial aid. Um, so we have a lot of great partners that have set up uh, these kinds of experiences for students. And then they also do an industry exploration where they take a virtual or in-person field trip to an industry partner to see what jobs in the field look like, right? Um, we have students who have visited companies in their local community that they've walked by since they were you know, toddlers and they never knew what happened inside these buildings. And now they have a reason to go in and see, oh yeah, this is the inside of Maycom. This is their fab. This is what they do here. This huge box that I walked by since I was five years old, never knew what happened there. Now they know what happens and they know what jobs in the industry look like. Okay, um, so I want to be clear too, this program is not getting into the math and science behind photonics. It gets very deep very fast. It's, as you can probably tell, focusing on applications, right? We start with the applications to get students interested, and then if they want to pursue the, the depth of the math and science behind it, that's where they can follow on with independent study or through other programs that, that currently exist in the world. So we started this program here in Massachusetts in 2021. It's run with almost a thousand students. Today it's actually running with 82 students at one of our partner schools in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Um, so it's run uh, a lot here and we kind of proved it out. And now we're expanding this program across the United States under a train the teacher model that we call Spark Alpha Explore. This launched last fall um, here in Massachusetts and now we've signed on a couple other places that I'll talk to you about in a second. In this model, we as Spark Photonics Foundation have created a suite of virtual training modules that we then distribute to K through 14 teachers through our community of practice, which is an online professionally hosted portal where they can access that material, they can access each other to share best practices and any challenges they're facing, and they can also access us directly for any help needed. The teachers then go through the training and they're empowered to take this program to their classes, teach it to their students in a way that resonates most with those students and continue to build on the program uh, with their classes year after year. It's distributed as a site license, meaning that they can run it uh, at their school in perpetuity and uh, with as many teachers as they want. So we're expanding this nationally now with support from sponsorship at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Education and nationally through the US Department of Defense as well as ANSYS, um, who, as I mentioned in response to Arturo's question, uh, we also use their software on the design side. So our, we're, it's, a, it's a great example of a, a company, ANSYS, kind of getting into both the technology and the workforce development along with us. I often get questions about how we actually introduce photonics in K-12, since it's a, a very uh, challenging topic to, to wrap one's head around. Um, so I embedded this video and I'd love to play it for you. It looks like we have the time. So um, it's about a seven minute video. 
I start off by doing a demonstration here of how photonics can be used to send information using light, tying that to the internet, right? Every student today can identify with the internet. And then we shift to an exp uh, explanation of how um, photonics can be shrunk down onto the surface of a wafer for integrated photonics. I'll have a little commentary over the course of the video, but before I play this, I'll just pause and see if there are any questions on what I presented so far. Okay. Oh, looks like Liliana. Yes. Okay, hi. Thank you so much hi. for your talk. Uh, well, first, um, I want to ask you about how is uh, made this uh, collaboration? Do you have a startup, a spin-off, or what is the type of um, yeah collaboration that you made with the university, the students? They can make uh, postgraduate or only uh, on their own graduate students are available to use or to visit your a uh, fab and also um, do you have scholarships or any um, like a summer schools something mm. for <laughs> other students outside to the US and finally I want to ask you about characterization of your materials because I was involved in uh, nanotechnology also I made my PhD in nanotechnology so I know that uh, one of the challenges part in the nanotechnology is the characterization of the material. So mm -hmm. which are the most important characterization that you carry on in your uh, photonics uh, circuits? Uh, also, thank you again for your presentation. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for those good questions. I, I jotted them down here and hopefully I captured enough in my um, quick notes here to to answer it. So um, thank you. Yeah. So just to clarify, um, Spark Photonics is not a foundry. We are completely labless and fabless. So we don't actually make anything ourselves. All we do is design and software. It's just us and our computers. Um, that's on the design side, on the nonprofit side. Also, no facilities. We're completely remote. Um, we go into classrooms and uh, up until 2023, and now we train teachers virtually. <laughs> Um, so to your first question, Liliana, about uh, partnerships. So uh, we are working with, so the way that our engagements work is, um, let me just go back to this, for example, previous slide. Yes, here we go. Great. Um, the Right now, um, we are training teachers in uh, elementary, middle, high school, and even uh, some college level folks to run our programming. They work with their class of students, and then we support them to go into their community to find, say, um, a, a college or university um, that's working in, ideally in photonics, if not in photonics and semiconductors, and if not in semiconductors, um, really anything in STEM or even entrepreneurship. We consider it a win if we get students interested in STEM at large. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the semiconductors, but of course we hope it is. Um, so we support them in finding those partnerships. If there's nothing locally, and of course this happens a lot where folks are, you know, in rural situations or they just they don't have uh, somebody in their in their local ecosystem who is in this line of business. We have other resources for them to be able to connect with folks virtually to do, for example, an expert talk for them and their students. Um, or to do activities with our students that expose them to some of these um, education and career pathways. Okay, so that's the, the just to address the partnership side. You asked about graduate students. We haven't run this program with graduate students, but of course, graduate students get um, involved in that when students visit a college or university, graduate students might be on hand to talk about some of the research they're doing and hopefully get these students excited about their research. Um, you, on the second one, asked about uh, scholarships and work outside the United States. To date, our work has been solely focused in the United States. It's funded by, uh, in large part, the U.S. government as well as our state government. So the mandate is that you know we grow in the U.S. But of course, uh, if there were opportunities outside the U.S., we would be interested in, in uh, exploring those as well. Um, as far as scholarships and things like that, um, a lot of our partners will provide those kinds of things. Um, we uh, typically partner with schools and universities to apply for grants. Um, oftentimes these grants include scholarships or internship opportunities for their students uh, to help uh, with this program or to help develop uh, programming internal to the school that can kind of complement our programming. 
Uh, and then finally, you asked about characterization um, of our, our structures, especially nanostructures. So uh, yeah, characterization is a huge part, right? We were showing the 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 beat pattern, the Mach center interferometer um, pattern there of those uh, those test structures. We work only with uh, measurement partners. We have some universities as well as some commercial entities that can do measurements of these chips. Um, but it is still um, a challenge for us, especially at these uh, the shorter wavelengths that we work at are not the typical telecom datacom wavelengths. Um, so uh, wavelengths under the 1300 nanometer kind of O band for telecom. There's really not a lot of people measuring those wavelengths. So um, this is this has been an area of exploration for us and finding more measurement partners uh, so that we can get the chips that we fabricate measured. You can make a lot of chips, right? Um, but it, it, if you're measuring them one by one, it takes a long time. And so this is also another thrust of ours to build up what's called wafer scale measurement capabilities at these shorter wavelengths. And that's something that we're working on on a couple of proposals right now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch back to this slide, and I'd like to play this video for you. Um, again, I'm going to jump in a little bit here, uh, but hopefully this gives you a good idea of how we at least have found it is effective to introduce this to the next generation. Um, and hopefully the sound plays for you here as well. If the sound doesn't play, uh, please just uh, somebody unmute and tell me it's not playing, and uh, we can find a different way. Hey, everyone. This is Kevin from Spark Photonics. I want to show you how the internet works. Do you use the internet? You probably do. You might even be using it to watch this video right now. How in the world does this video get to you over the internet? Well, you might be surprised to learn that all the information sent over the internet is sent using light. What does it even mean? Most people don't know that the internet runs on light, and it's hard to even fathom what it means to send information using light. So that's what I want to demonstrate to you. And I have a little setup to do so. First thing is this solar cell that's been connected to a speaker. And the second part is this LED flashlight that's connected to my phone. When I press play on my phone, it's going to play a song. The song is going to be put through this cable that goes into the flashlight. And in response to the sound that my phone is sending through that cable, the flashlight is going to turn on and off really fast. That light that the flashlight is going to be putting out is essentially sending something like Morse code. It's sending that information from the phone in light format. And the solar cell is going to be able to pick up that light and turn it back into an electric signal and put it out through the speaker so you can hear the song. Okay, here we go. I'm going to turn the flashlight on. It's not sending anything. And then I press play on my phone. And now the flashlight is sending this song via light. You can't see it. It's flashing on and off way too fast for us to see. But this solar cell can see it. And when I turn the solar cell and speaker on and shine the flashlight at the solar cell, you'll hear the song. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to turn it on without shining the flashlight at it. You just hear a little bit of static from the light in the room. But once I shine the flashlight at it, there's the song. Shine the flashlight away. Again, you can't see the flashing, but it's, it's flashing very, very fast. And back. If I cover the flashlight up with my fingers, it stops the song too. If I let a little bit of light through, the song is very faint. So that's how the internet sends information using light. Well, it's not exactly how it does. I'm just going to pause there and tell you that this demonstration is typically what we do in, in the class. The next part is uh, is extra. Um, we do send this kit, which is a commercial kit, to teachers who are adopting the program so they can do this demonstration with their students. It doesn't use a series of flashlights and solar cells, but it's close. It actually uses a series of fancy flashlights called lasers. And at the other end, instead of a solar cell, it uses a detector, which is not that dissimilar from a solar cell. It doesn't send that information through the air, of course. It sends it through something called fiber optics. If you've ever heard of Verizon Fios, Fios stands for fiber optic service, and this is what it is. This looks like angel hair pasta. This is a one meter long fiber optic cable. If I take a laser pointer and shine it into one end of the fiber optic, you can actually see it comes out the other end. 
I can turn it off, turn it back on, and you see it always comes through. I can also bend this fiber optic around and it still comes out the other end. So I could flash this on and off really fast and send essentially a Morse code signal to something at the other end, a computer with a detector that can then take that information and put it out, let's say, to your screen in the form of this video. This is a very short fiber optic. They can be made much longer. Here's 100 meters. They can be made miles or even thousands of miles long. And that's how the internet sends information from place to place. There are thousands and thousands of miles of fiber optic cables across continents and between continents to make the internet work. What a fiber optic actually looks like in practice is something like this. It's coated in a rubber jacketing and at either end, something called a transceiver. Transceiver is short for transmitter receiver. Each of these transceivers has a laser and a detector inside it, and it can send and receive information from the other transceiver that's sent through this fiber optic. Again, the fiber optic could be thousands of miles long, and you still get the signal out from one transceiver to the other. So that's how the inform information is sent across the internet. Compare this to let's say this coaxial cable. You might see something like this coming out of the back of your TV and going into the wall. It's good for short distances, but it can't send nearly as much information as a fiber optic cable. It also takes a lot more energy to send information through this coax than it does through the fiber optic. So that's why the internet runs on light. It can send lots of information really fast with low energy. So that's how you can send information using light, but you can do a lot more with light than just sending information. For example, we can use light to sense things in the environment. For example, we can sense chemicals in the environment, and we can also sense the distance from one object to another, let's say for a self-driving car, to be able to see how far it is from a pedestrian. But if you're thinking about a sensor, you don't want it to be large like a fiber optic cable. You want it to typically be as small and as lightweight as possible. And in order to make these devices very small and lightweight, we use advanced manufacturing technologies in semiconductors to shrink devices down onto the surface of what's called a semiconductor wafer. This is a semiconductor wafer that's eight inches in diameter. Within this wafer, there are thousands of devices. You can't really see it with the naked human eye, but if you look at this with a microscope, you can see thousands and thousands of very, very small devices. Each one can perform its own actions and can be used for things like sensing. You then cut this wafer up using a fancy saw so that it's turned into chips like you might find inside your computer. This is an integrated photonic chip. Integrated means put together. There are lots of sensing devices that have been put together on the surface of this chip. The spirals you see on this chip can be used to sense harmful gases in the atmosphere. You can have hundreds or even thousands of devices on one chip. So you can imagine how powerful that can be in such a small chip to be able to do hundreds or thousands of things. I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration how the internet sends information using light and how it can shrink these light devices down using integrated photonics to do amazing things. I'm Kevin from Spark Photonics. Thanks for watching. All right. So I'm happy to say, right, the word is getting out about this. Um, we were recently profiled on MIT News, spreading the word about photonics to build up the US workforce. And ANSYS, our partner, uh, who also supplies our design software, has written a blog post about us. We've also been doing quite a few of these presentations to try to get the word out, help folks think about addressing the younger generation um, when we when we talk about building up the semiconductor workforce. I'm happy to say, even though Spark, Spark Alpha was uh, nucleated in Massachusetts, we recently signed uh, with Montana to expand to some schools there. 
Montana, if you're not familiar, is a, a large state in the northwestern part of the United States. So um, quite different in, in geography and demographics from Massachusetts. We want to prove this program in a lot of different um, different situations, different different areas of, of uh, the country. And so we're in conversation with a number of other states in addition to Montana, um, hoping to announce some very soon uh, with further expansion plans. And just to give you a sneak preview, right, we're not um, just stopping with Spark Alpha. I mentioned, right, we try to get students interested in the science and the math behind it, and now we want to provide them some progression to get into it more deeply. So this is a sneak peek of our next program, Spark Beta, which is an introduction to semiconductors and advanced manufacturing through the lens of simple Python coding. Um, on our design side, we use Python as our primary language to do our design work. And we also know that Python is a langu language that's accessible to students uh, from a very young age. So this is um, distributed as packaged curriculum, and it's just three sessions long. It's meant, by the way, to be packaged curriculum um, in a way that the adopting teacher needs to have no knowledge about Python or semiconductors or photonics, just like with Spark Alpha. They don't need to know anything about the field. They just need to help students think critically through the program. Same thing in Spark Beta. They just help students work through this uh, curriculum. It starts with a very simple introduction and in coding in Python, and then it introduces them to semiconductors and photonics and how these can be designed using scripted languages like Python. And then finally in session three, it culminates with a mock design and layout of a chip using basically a PowerPoint, but then the students watch an actual professional layout engineer from our design side do the layout using Python. By the way, the layout example that we're using here is actually the virus sensing example from the University of Rochester. So they're laying out uh, something that's very similar to what is used in that virus sensing chip. So it's all very real, it's very current, it's cutting edge, and it's informed by what's actually happening in industry. Um, but still, we may, we want to really make this accessible to everyone. Um, we don't we want it to be you know low barrier and not intimidating, and trying to get more people to see that this is a a future that they can pursue. With that, I'll finish up. Uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, very much appreciate your taking the time with me today. Thank you, um, Andy, for um, that outstanding presentation. So, I was somebody have a question or comment about the presentation or want to engage with the professor Kelly. Uh, we don't have any questions. So, thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope we can collaborate in the future. Excellent. Thank you all. Muchas gracias, todos. Hasta luego.